Well, welcome everyone. Good to see you. We've got a bunch of folks online. So we're doing this as a hybrid uh, science cafe tonight. So I wouldn't be surprised if a few more folks join us and I'm certain online we'll get, we'll get some folks as well. But welcome. We're very excited to uh, be back in person with our science cafes and uh, great to see those of you who are able to join us in person. And hello to everyone who is joining us online. So we're very excited to bring everyone together this evening to talk about a topic that we don't usually touch on, and that is collaboration in science and the importance, uh, the important role that that plays in, in moving science forward. So we have our two examples of the perfect collaboration with us this evening. We have Dr. Dustin Updike, who is an associate professor here at the MDI Biological Laboratory. Um, and uh, joined us in 2013, I think. Oh, 12. Yeah. Boy, time flies so Ten fast. Years. Gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> 10 years. Um, and, and so uh, he is joined by Dr. Brett Kuyper, who uh, you now are spending your third summer collaborating with us here at MBIBL. So welcome. So Brett is a senior faculty member at the, let me make sure I get this correct, the Brody School of Medicine at East Carolina University. So he's, it's cool here for him and a little warm for us, but uh, we're excited to, <laughs> to have him. So um, what we want to do today is just talk a bit about how uh, the, the visiting scientist program at the MDI Biological Laboratory works, some of the unique facets of that, but also really just talk about, you know, the way collaboration, how science works in general, the fact that it's definitely a team sport, right? This is not um, something that people typically do in isolation, especially I think as science becomes, you know, we tackle these more complex problems. And we were chatting a little bit before as we were preparing for this, really saying it's impossible to be an expert in everything. So you really have to depend upon uh, your colleagues and the, and the um, expertise of others. And so how you do that, how you work together in a productive way is kind of a science all in itself, I think. But um, <clears throat> I think those of you who are familiar with the MDI Biological Lab know that from our earliest days, we had this very collaborative nature about the work that was done here and welcomed scientists from, you know, all definitely throughout the United States and abroad to come and do work here for a certain, you know, a certain part of the year. And we were largely seasonal for our first 100 years. But due to that vision that George Dore and others had about being located here on Mount Desert Island and this being a place where scientists could really come and study nature, sort of be, um, observe nature, learn from nature. That was his original thinking when he recruited the first scientists to come here just about a hundred years ago. So in 1921 was the first year that we had science here on Mount Desert Island um, at the MDI Biological Lab. So that tradition very much continues today. And we, this summer, I think have 12 uh, visiting faculty members with us throughout over the course of the year. And one of the things that uh, Dr. Haller, our president, has sort of laid out as a, a thought about the future is to really expand on that visiting scientist program. And I think certainly most people want to be here in July and August because that is the, <laughs> the most beautiful time of year. But we are um, expanding and welcoming people here year round. In fact, um, have a number of new visiting faculty members who may have a more sort of permanent uh, visiting position here at the lab. So maybe for like one to three years and they might travel back and forth, but there could potentially be staff that are here full time working in the lab with um, a collaborator. So that's a new model that we're exploring and I think really excited about. So lots of things changing, but what I wanted to do today was really talk in a little more detail about the work that these guys are doing, um, but also about how they work together and sort of, you know, where some of the opportunities are in that, but also maybe some of the challenges. I'm sure it um, has its moments where it's a little tough. And I think, um, you know, hearing your thoughts about that. And so Dustin, I don't know if the easiest thing might be for you to just start and give us quick, sort of a quick um, overview of your work, what the project is that the two of you, or at least a, a sense of what the project is that the two of you are working on, which is for it. Okay, yeah. Um, so I I think that probably most of you know, I work um, with C. elegans, and, and these are these uh, very small nematodes about a millimeter long, um, but they are uh, an indispensable tool for biomedical research because they have all of, almost all of the genes that we have. And so if we want to understand 
how genes function in uh, different pathways, uh, cancer pathways or disease uh, pathways or um, developmental pathways. It's much easier to um, do the genetics in these animals and, and find out the basics of how things work first um, so that you can uh, apply them to these other topics. And so um, I, this is uh, the organism that I work with and it's also the organism that Brett Kuyper works with as well. And, um, and so uh, the specific area that we're interested in uh, is the, the, the development of the germline. And so these are the cells that <clears throat> um, are, are dividing and um, giving rise to the cells that will differentiate into gametes, into eggs and sperm. And then these gametes fertilize and then they <clears throat> uh, give rise to the next generation of the organism. And so the, the, uh, the, the central question that I'm always trying to ask is how um, are these cells capable of this immortal and totipotent potential um, when the rest of the cells that make up our, our bodies or the bodies of these worms um, are differentiated and, and terminal? Um, they uh, adopt a certain fate and then they get locked into that fate. And so those are uh, the big questions that we're trying to get at in the lab. And, um, and then uh, I, I think um, a few years ago, I realized that there were some things that I, were, I, I wouldn't be able to uh, gain a, a, a complete understanding of this process without bringing in some extra expertise. And so this is where um, Brett comes in uh, as we realized that um, the questions that we have are very similar, but it, it's the interface where um, I don't completely know um, the things that he knows and, mm -hmm. and he doesn't completely know the things that I know. And if we can kind of um, put our heads together, we might be able to figure it out where um, we weren't able to before. That's great. So Brett, tell me how your work is maybe a little complimentary. How, how does your work really fit or dovetail with what Dustin just described for us? Are you working on similar approaches? So. Yeah, I think Dustin described it very well that we um, that we're working around the same problem, but coming from two very mm -hmm. different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So Dustin's expertise in cell biology and gene engineering and so on were things that that I simply don't have an expertise in either. And um, <clears throat> my training is mostly in uh, biochemistry, looking at nucleic acids and and particularly RNA. And um, so Dustin and I both have this interest in RNA, but from the standpoint of, um, you know, in, in, in the case Dustin's talking about, um, how does that RNA have an effect on what these cells become, on how they will differentiate or, or uh, hesitate to differentiate? Mm -hmm. And from my standpoint, I'm very interested in what are the activities that the RNA has in the cell? Uh, who does it interact with? And what are the, um, the uses? And uh, the really interesting part of RNA, and, and I mean, it's probably come to the fore now with the, the advent of the COVID vaccines and so on, is that RNA is this information molecule, uh, and it it is just one step removed from imparting the information to a cell. Mm -hmm. um, if you know how that information, in one case, is used, and another case, is actually what we call translated into the activity, um, you can start to break apart what are what are the, the drives or motivations that the cell is undergoing, which allows it to go from an undifferentiated stem cell type cell to a, uh, to a, a, a mature sperm or a mature egg. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, you know, uh, an area that I think we are, there's a lot of excitement about in, in the field now. Um, and it takes, it, and it, it takes number of, of, scientists coming in with different perspectives and different um, specialties to be able to sort of parse that apart. Mm, absolutely. So it strikes me, you know, <clears throat> we often think about how far science has come. You know, if we look over the last, you know, 100 years, and it's amazing. And, and I think, especially when you take an example like COVID and how quickly, um, in some ways, you know, we were able to develop a vaccine and just sort of this whole worldwide effort. I mean, that's an amazing feat. Mm -hmm. And yet, and we know so much about how, you know, how this virus worked, like where we could really have the greatest impact. And yet, 
when we think about it, there's also so many questions that remain unanswered about, you know, what's happening in ourselves. And I was, you know, thinking about this. I mean, there are entire institutes that are dedicated just to cell science. <laughs> so it's, it's always amazing to me that we are able to make these advances while at the same time, really still a lot of unanswered questions. And I'm just, you know, curious from your perspective, it must be really exciting in some ways, because this is new knowledge. I mean, this, this must be, although frustrating, I'm sure it must kind of keep you, um, keep you motivated. So very yeah, very busy. <laughs> I, I'm just curious a little bit about, you know, what is it that drives you to do this type of work, say, as opposed to studying a very disease specific kind of thing, like Alzheimer's or what have you, uh, you know, what made you choose sort of this path? Uh, speaking personally, I think it for me is a sense of discovery, and mm -hmm. I'm not saying that there aren't discoveries made um, uh, in in uh, the very applied um, biomedical research, but um, for me, uh, it's the opportunity to see something for the very first time with mm -hmm. a gene that nobody has looked at before, and nobody knows what yeah. they're what it's doing in mm -hmm. the cell. And then um, and to bring that, to expose that um, to others so that they can start thinking about it and understand why it's uh, uh, being upregulated in, in their specific um, tumor or um, why it, it might be shutting off in certain cell types and, and what the consequence that may be. So all of that has to start somewhere. And mm -hmm. so um, those initial uh, descriptions of gene function are um, things that uh, interest me a lot. Mm. What about you? Mm. Well, I, I think as, as Dustin was saying, the, the, um, the, the new understanding to, to um, you know, part, part of what makes this work so exciting is just when you get to the point where you understand one thing, you discover five more that need to be unraveled, right? Job so, security. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean, in, in a way, and and I think that, you know, Dustin sort of spoke to the, the balance we have between basic science research and very focused disease needed research, because a lot of the basic science concepts that we study, how does RNA work and what does it do, mm. um, will apply to things like germ cells, but it will also apply to things like tumor genesis or things like tissue differentiation or regeneration of, uh, mm -hmm. of tissues from, I know, from stem cells and things like that. That, um, that, that technology and, that, and those insights are, are broadly uh, applicable to lots of other things. Um, this is like historically always been the case. People used to work all the time on bacteria, uh, on E. coli in the gut. And, um, not because we were so excited about bacteria, but because it was teaching us about almost every other organism and the way those organisms express genes. Mm -hmm. um, we're you know a few steps past the bacteria and working with this this worm, but um, uh, as Dustin said, it has the the right types of tissues, the right types of genes um, that that relate to our own, and everything we find out about how those genes work, what the RNA is doing, how the information gets passed in the cell, uh, and what step does it take when the information is there, that becomes applicable to other, other areas. And, and you see that in literature. You see the, you know, the discovery, um, RNA interference is, is um, maybe a topic for people. The discovery of RNA interference and how, um, and how it works, and a lot of that was actually done in, in worms and some in plants. Um, and then the ability to try to apply that to uh, medical technologies. And mm -hmm. there are now therapies being designed around that technology. Uh, it, that, that part's exciting. Um, so I, I, I like the perspective we were working from um, finding out the, the, the uh, mechanisms that are the basis of how the cell works. And then other people are going to probably be smarter than me in terms of knowing how to apply that. That's amazing. So I want to go back to this idea of collaboration and tell me a little bit, Brett, how you first came to work together. How did that come about? This is, this is a really interesting story. So here's where, where genealogy matters. <laughs> um, so Dustin uh, did some his postdoctoral work with um, a, a tremendous scientist named Susan Strom. And I was a postdoc with, uh, that was at the time she was in Indiana, I'm moving somewhere else. And then, 
uh, I was doing a postdoc with uh, uh, a gentleman named uh, Bob Rhodes, and they had formed a collaboration. And it was really kind of out of the blue. There was a discovery made in one lab. They contacted the other lab based on the gene, and, and they said, hey, we have a common interest. And so they began collaborating, and I actually got to be a part of that as it, as it developed. And through that uh, interaction, then I met Dustin, who was working with Susan Strum and later on, and, and then we met at uh, research meetings and conferences, discussed some ideas and realized our interests are quite similar, but we've got very different bags of tools that we use to do this. Mm -hmm. And um, so long about, you know, I, I, I interacted with Dustin through meetings. Uh, we, we, uh, we had, I have another, a, a, a lot of other colleagues that we know in common. And, uh, and then, you know, one of the discussions I was having with Dustin, he said, you know, um, uh, and MBWL has this, this program for visiting scientists. And he said, um, what do you think if you were to, to come up and spend a little time, do you think we could get some things accomplished? And, and I thought, wow, this is great, yes. Because <laughs> it's, there's something about being in the same environment and you know, speaking face-to-face -face and interacting and working on the same experiments. Even today I had Dustin in the, the microscope room with me looking at the fluorescence pattern of, of one of the genes that we're interested in looking at. And, you can only do that when you're really together. kind of mm -hmm. um, in, in the same place. Mm -hmm. There's a lot you can do remotely and you send data to support, but the, the real exciting steps forward probably get done. The barriers are broken down. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so Dustin, what I really want to know is, are you able to go you know, somewhere warm in February? Like, is this a reciprocal <laughs> relationship? Or is this only He's, 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 he's in North Carolina once. We're going to try to get him to go. That's right. <laughs> January would be great. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. Herman has a question. Yeah, Herman, go ahead. I'd like to know <clears throat> how does it work during the day? Do you talk to each other about experiments? Uh, do you devise experiments uh, during uh, March and then you start doing them here together? And uh, uh, how long does an experiment? work, you know, if you would make a movie of you, would you be like history journalists in DC or how? Yeah. So, you, you, oh, uh, so um, like Brett said, this is his third summer here. And so we um, have been working together for a while and uh, we uh, have, um, we're almost finished writing the, our first co-authored publication. And so it does take a an incredibly long time to get things from start to finish. Mm -hmm. um, but during that time, I mean, this is the initial one, but um, we were kicking off projects constantly. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so uh, the one that, um, the project that, the, the microscopy work that Brett was talking about today, this um, really spawned from a conversation that we had last summer. Mm -hmm. And um, and Brett came in and said, wouldn't it be great if we could build this? And I said, you know, I think we can build it. Um, with these reagents, and so we did that, and Brett got the lines and and devised these strains, and then we've actually had to help each other with the troubleshooting a little bit. But um, you know, as of today, that that's working, and it's working phenomenally well, in mm -hmm. my opinion. And so, you know, it, it's a snowball effect. Yeah. <laughs> that's really cool. I love that. Um, I, I, to, to answer your question about day to day. Um, it sort of depends on things, if things are working well. If, if it's not working well, I'm not sure I want to see Dustin <laughs> and, and show him the, the ugly results. But um, but today I was so excited, I went and knocked on his door. I didn't care if he was in a meeting or not. <laughs> come, and, come and look at this. Um, and I think that's the fun part of it. Um, but the, the as, as Dustin said, the planning is long term. So a lot of the things we're doing uh, right now, one of the reasons I came to, uh, to Dustin's lab to begin with is to become more expert and learn more about this, this technology called CRISPR, uh, which allows us to go into the, the worm's genome and, and very precisely engineer it. Um, I didn't have the background, nor did I have all of the equipment, et cetera, to, to really set that up uh, in my lab. And we made attempts and it was not going well. And, uh, and when, you know, even uh, three years ago when I came, Dustin said, hey, let's, let's work on some of these and I'll, I'll show you how we apply the technology. I'll show you how you develop the reagents. 
um, this this uh, recent project now where we have these these lines that are working, uh, as he said, we we planned those out last year and, and it took us probably several weeks just to sit down on the computers and figure out the sequences and understand how they will be connected together and de develop a version one and then find the problems with version one and redesign it for version two, et cetera. Um, that part is, it all precedes being able to actually do the experiment. So sometimes that's the weeks or months. Um, so I, um, uh, I feedback. I'm getting feedback. I, I'm curious, Brett, you know, you mentioned CRISPR and, you know, wanting to come, part of what was driving it was to come and, and take advantage of Justin's expertise. It always strikes me as, you know, folks who are coming from larger institutions, mm -hmm. really, right? Why why would you want to come here to the MBI Biological Lab? And is it really worth, I mean, of course, it's beautiful, but, you know, like, what, what is really the, the draw for you to mm -hmm. come to a place like this? I mean, it seems like I would imagine you have lots of um, resources at your disposal mm -hmm. there in the larger institution. So I'm just curious from your perspective why it's worthwhile mm -hmm. um, to come. So the resources, yeah, are, are available to me um, in, in, in terms of instruments and reagents, et cetera. And, we, you know, we, Justin and I each carry um, federal grants that allow us to purchase the things we need. But a, an expert person to show you how to conduct that uh, experiment is, is mm -hmm. in, in a sense, much more valuable. Um, it's what's going to get you to actually being able to, to design and, and design a, a, a strategy cor correctly and then be able to apply it. Um, as it turns out, and back at, uh, at East Carolina University at the Brody School of Medicine, there, there are about seven or eight different scientists who, who apply and utilize CRISPR technology but in very different systems, not in the cell yeah. line system, and uh, they're doing it in uh, in cell lines or they're doing it in mice, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And the application is, is different. Uh, as much as I tried to learn from those, um, to bring it into the system I'm working with required somebody who really knew as well as I know, you know like Justin, mm -hmm. and he has that expertise. So I'm thinking that, you know, why why do we get CRISPR to work so well? And I think that um, a lot of it might be serendipitous, but, you know, we we had um, early on uh, set up and made a request for some instruments that would allow us to do this right when the technology was new and being developed. And, and um, uh, we went ahead and, and tried it. And then um, I had a rotation student that had got our first CRISPR line and it once we saw that, we knew it would change everything that we did, and we actually stopped everything that we were doing, and 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 we quit using these old lines to make these new lines in that position as well. Um, and then uh, once we had that, um, we I don't know, just kind of got a reputation, and and I think that um, the other great thing is that I got the right people too. Um, uh, Catherine Sharp in my lab has. Um, uh, been doing uh, making a CRISPR uh, worms and injecting them for six years now, over six mm -hmm. years now. And um, I often I can't. It's very hard to find people who like to do these kind of injections. Mm -hmm. And so you know it's just uh, uh, um, we we're well positioned. And so now we have um, a lot of people coming to us. We have um, the the companies that we order our reagents from contacting us and mm -hmm. saying you know we we'd like for you to pilot this new. Um, this new uh, type of uh, reagent that we have, will you do that? And so the, the experiment that we yeah, started last when summer. we did last summer, we got, we, you know, it, the company contacted yeah. Dustin and said, we'd like you to try this. And we said, great, we have, a, we have an application. We have an application and there's no way we would have even attempted <laughs> no. it without this new reagent. And right. so um, fortunately it worked. It took a while to get it to work, but fortunately it did. And so... Um, I feel like we're ahead of the curve on that, and, yeah. and now um, it, it will be a um, uh, really good proof of principle. <laughs> yeah, and, and the proof of the pudding about um, about being able to actually learn it and take it elsewhere is that I've been able to go back to North Carolina with this technology and the reagents, and I've been able to develop new lines there using the CRISPR technology. So we're We've got six new lines uh, in the, in the time since I started, you know, learning this from Dustin, um, and we're doing other types of experiments too, where 
where it's, it's a matter of sharing expertise. So one of the things my lab does is a lot of biochemical work looking at um, ribosomes and at how they bind messenger RNAs and, and the process that, that drives the, the, the translation into protein. And, um, you know, I, I learned that technology from other scientists, from um, Bob Rhodes in, in, in LS, at LSU and, uh, and others. And, um, and Dustin had said to me, this is a technology I think that would be really useful to use here. Um, can you, you know, can you come up and talk to some of the people about it? And uh, there are others here, Eric Rogers and, and Jared Rollins, who both also apply uh, that type of fractionation system. So um, that the sharing kind of goes, you know, but really in multiple directions. Whenever you're interacting with a scientist who says, yeah, I could use that, um, you know, please, please help me to, to learn that. Jared, what's um, the I, I don't know, I'm a very visual person. Yeah. And I want to make some points for what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is a this is a diagram of a cell. And this is something that all of you have seen before. You might have remembered, I mean, not much has changed in this diagram from the past 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just want to review it and, and kind of give you a perspective of where we're at and where we're at right now in this process. And, and so the, the central dogma of molecular biology is that we have DNA in the nucleus of your cell and on it are our genes and these genes. Um, include instructions for making proteins. And those instructions are the mRNA, that is the nucleotide cell transcription. And then the mRNA, this red molecule here, um, it has a splicing that is transported out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And then here it encounters um, factors that uh, turn this mRNA message into a protein. And so, um, it, that's, you know, that hasn't changed for a long time. Um, but the, the question for us really is that since we have all of the same instructions in the nucleus, why do we, why are we able mm -hmm. to get all of these different cell types from uh, the same set of instructions and how does that work? And so um, if you go to the, I get to go to the next slide. Um, so, as uh, biologists, we specialize, and when we specialize, we start looking at something, you know, in, in here, uh, some components right in, in the cell, and our, our blinders are on, and we're focused on, on this little area, and it's kind of hard to um, grant out time of that. And so my specialty is um, these things called germ granules. And in this process, um, the germ granules are kind of uh, like an oil droplet, but they reside right at the nuclear periphery. And they act as kind of a safety net or a, a screening mechanism to survey the mRNA transcripts that are coming out of the nucleus and before they get um, translated into protein. And so the germ granules are specifically in uh, the stem cells, the germline stem cells that give rise to. Um, sperm and egg uh, that will then fertilize into the next generation. And, um, and we put a lot of effort in understanding what those germ families do. Now, what was really obvious after we started getting into the genetics of it um, and into some of the biochemistry is that we kept getting components of uh, the, transla the translation and initiation um, uh, complexes. And so these translation and initiation factors are the factors that bind to that mRNA and uh, direct it to ribosomes so that it can be made into protein. Um, and this isn't my field at all. And so um, when we were, when Brett and I were talking about this interface, it was just obvious that this wasn't something that I can tackle. And um, it was something that I could really use as expertise and expertise. Um, uh, and his experience, uh, just being around my students to learn the technology um, for us to understand how translation and initiation work. And so that is, um, that's one thing that we're looking at. Um, and so uh, I'll go to the final slide. 
Um, and as we mentioned, we're doing this in C. elegans, these nematodes. They, um, they're a millimeter long, they look like this, um, but they're perfect for looking at germ granules because you can see them in the transparent animals at all of the stages of, um, of development. And so the germline stem cells are here, and then they make the meiosis and turn into oocytes and sperm. And the germ granules, I don't know if these movies are played or not, but the germ granules are uh, very dynamic and they segregate to the germline blocks in there. And, um, and so this that makes it really easy to um, ask the questions that we want to ask. Um, these worms uh, have a generation time of four days, mm -hmm. and they and you can grow up in a week. You can grow up millions of them, mm -hmm. and so the amount of genetics that you can do and the cost of it, um, they're growing on these little inexpensive petri dishes. Um, uh, you can get a lot done in a quick amount of time. Mm -hmm. So, um, so anyway, back to the centerface. What we know now is that there's a handoff between these germ granules and the translation indication of the uh, machine. And so Brett and I are looking at that. And one of the things that my lab needed to look at that was to understand, uh, it's really look easy to look at RNA expression levels. So most scientists are um, take the easy way out and we look at the <laughs> transcriptional regulation and then we leave it at that and go on. But this whole other, um, area of regulation in the cell is, is the translational regulation that happens. And so um, Brett and coming to the lab brings his toolkit and knowledge um, for us to be able to open those um, areas up and address the questions that we need to understand this handoff from uh, the germ granules to translation initiation factors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, I mean, it's interesting because you chose the title handoff for this, uh, <laughs> for this uh, discussion. And um, what's interesting uh, from my perspective of the handoff is that um, it's it's not simply um, being the the RNA being in position A and going to position B. There there appears now from the from the data that we're collecting to be a, a very intricate uh, interplay between these factors a, a, and sort of by the nature of the way these proteins act. Um, Dustin mentioned this germ granule is really kind of a droplet. It, it seems like it's being it's invaded by some factors that can get in there and and sort of move around and the, the term we use now is remodel um, that these structures get remodeled uh, and and the interactions eventually move toward the um, the translation initiation apparatus and that's where my training is and and what we're learning is that we can we can see these two um, the, uh, two states as more of a continuum than as uh, step A to step B. Um, and so, so that's what makes it exciting is now we think this isn't really two separate fields. It's not really two separate areas, it's one, but the nature of it wasn't really recognized until more recently. And I, I'm, I'm gonna put in a little, little um, plug here. So I teach this area of, uh, to, my, to my students in the medical and the, uh, and the graduate students Studies, and I always tell them the DNA uh, has the, you know the template and the information, and the RNA is a is a copy and, a, and the the message that's going to go out in the cell. But you don't get any new activity until it's made into protein. And so all of those steps that go toward um, getting the messenger RNA made and processed and exported from the nucleus uh, are not going to be the things that drive a, a cell forward in differentiation or drive it forward in, in dividing and, and making proliferating. It's when the, it's actually decoded into a protein, and that protein is what has the activities necessary to take the next um, fate step, if you will, for a, for a yeah. So we're at, I think, the most exciting part of that, of that gene expression uh, aspect. And it plays out in these, you know, in these germ cells, but certainly also plays out in tissues and in uh, and in disease states and tumors and things like that. Fascinating. So you mentioned, Dustin, that you're, you know, you're you got a publication together. I mean, that is it's obviously part of what you want to do is share the results of this work that you all are doing together. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about what is that, how important is that, and then what does that lead to? What does that process look like on the other? 
on the other end. Well, grant funding, uh, I guess. <laughs> yeah. grant funding. It's a big circle. <laughs> um, so uh, the the project that we're trying to get out now that it is um, it's very interesting because for the first time we we look at um, translational regulation when we mess these germ granules up. And so uh, prior to this time, it's all been all about the transcriptional regulation. Now we're showing that there is an impact uh, at differential translation that is happening. Um, and then we found some surprises along the way. Um, we found that um, one of the things that we observed a few years ago is that when you compromise these germ granules, you lose the, the stem cell-like properties of these germline stem cells and um, they begin to express markers of uh, somatic differentiation. And uh, that mean, meaning uh, that they turn on um, neuronal transcription factors and they start uh, firing neuron genes and they even send out neurite processes from these germ cells. And, um, and so this, this work that we did looking at the translational regulation of what is happening actually provided insight for us to know what um, even before you see any defects in the germ cells, um, can you detect a difference in transcription and translation in these cells? Mm -hmm. And that's going to tell you the primary, distinguish the primary effects from the secondary effects that might be related to more um, pleiotropic uh, defects in the cell. And that's kind of hard to do, but um, when you are able to do that, you can get now at the mechanism of how the proteins are. Um, regulating cell fate. Mm. And so from this, we um, uh, identified a couple of different um, classes of transcripts that either get repressed in the presence of germ granules or get turned on. Um, and so that's what this first mm -hmm. paper will be on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. <clears throat> and so, Brett, you mentioned that when you first came to collaborate with Desmond, you had some funding from the Salisbury Cove Research mm -hmm. um, Fund. So this is a fund that was established by Tom Marin, who was a visiting scientist here for many, many years, and um, basically is an endowed fund to help support continued collaborative um, relationships like the one you all are, are working on now. And tell me a little bit about, so you, you were here and then you were able to get some additional funding to come back, is that, is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so the, um, my initial work at the, in North Carolina is, is funded by a, a grant from the NSF that, that has is really focused on the tr translation work we're doing, somewhat unrelated to, to the work with Dustin. Um, but as a function of, of having gotten the funding from Delta Cove and, and, and starting these collaborative projects with Dustin, it occurred to me that this would be something that we should also pursue uh, funding wise. And, about that time, I had a conversation with my program officer at, at NSF, and she said, well, we know we have this new program uh, that's called the Mid-Career Award, and it allows you to go to a, a, a colleague investigator's uh, laboratory to learn new technologies, and to do. I said, man, I'm, this is what I'm doing. I'm doing this at, <laughs> at, at MDIBL, and, and so she said, you absolutely should uh, submit that. So Dustin and I worked together on that on that uh, grant proposal, and uh, it was funded in 2020? last year. Last year, uh, and that that kind of solidified the um, my ability to be able to come back and uh, and continue this this collaboration. Um, but it also represents the first step of of our actually um, putting together a funded project uh, collaboratively, and that's an important thing to establish, mm -hmm. um, particularly for the agency. They want to see, do you work well together? Are, are, these, are these really complementary mindsets and complementary technologies? Um, and when they see evidence of that, then they're more likely to, to, you know, to continue that. So uh, we, we do have some plans in the future to try to keep this going and, and look for um, ways to, to do collaborative funding. And obviously each of us has uh, you know, things going on in the laboratory that, that are distinct from this. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we want to try and maintain those as well. Mm -hmm. but, um, and Dustin, do you have plans also outside of that funding mechanism to sort of pursue other grant opportunities related to this collaboration? Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that um, uh, one thing that is dangerous, and I think that the NIH and NSF know this, is that 
um, it's easy to get trapped in in your little area of extra expertise. You know, you can look at that diagram of the cell, and you'll you'll know um, you'll pick any any organelle in that cell, and you'll know who the experts are that know all about that. Um, but you know, it's the idea that um, uh, the the there might be inter there has to be interplay between mm -hmm. all of these organelles and all of the messages, and that um, you limit yourself and it, by by focusing too much on something. And so um, the idea for these collaborative projects is to open up um, your um, field of view a little bit more and look outside of that. And those kind of um, those kind of processes lead to really uh, important discoveries and new ideas. Yeah, that's great. So Brett, with that in mind, um, certainly, you know, coming here to work directly with Dustin was a big incentive, but are there other advantages that you, you know, maybe realized of being here at the MBI Biological Lab, other collaborators maybe, or other conversations that have stimulated new ideas for you outside of Dustin? So yeah, one of the, the really exciting things is that um, when, when I'm not in lab working or when, when we're not looking at the microscope together, uh, I'm out interacting with other scientists here, and uh, I mentioned, you know, um, Eric and, and Jared, who are both scientists also working in, in the similar system, and also with interests that, are, that kind of dovetail with mm -hmm. what I'm doing. And so, um, in fact, I'm, I'm going to be talking to Jared tomorrow about a project that we might um, be, you know, helping each other out with or, or um, uh, developing something new. Um, one of the, the important reagents that, that actually make the, made this last experiment work was something that, that Jared was, was very willing to, to give to me. And so um, you, don't, you don't really get further unless you're, you're willing to ask and willing to give uh, a, you know, of your own expertise and of your own reagents. And then um, what you realize is that uh, this is better moving forward with, you know, collaborations like this and also looking for something new, some, mm -hmm. some new direction, a new collaboration. Um, the, the type of, of data that we, uh, uh, that we accumulate now with, in this new age of informatics, we have, mm -hmm. um, you know, bioinformatic uh, work in, in nucleic acids. And so we, we, we look at transcriptomics and we translate and uh, in, in proteins, we look at uh, proteomics. Um, one of my colleagues at, uh, at in ECU has an expertise in proteomics and also happens to be um, uh, interested in research in mitochondria. It just so happens that m some of the, the proteins that are, or the transcripts that are showing up and as being differentially regulated in these germ cells are things that are, are mitochondrial in nature. Well, I don't know enough about why they're there and what they should be, but I can talk to my colleague Tanya, and she, you know, she'll have some insights on it and probably suggest a new direction. And um, I, I really like that about the the the, uh, the field. You're mm -hmm. you're always almost always having to be introduced to somebody new, and you're almost always having to invite them to be part of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But you know, the other added benefit is for our trainees mm -hmm. um, through these collaborations. And so I have um, a couple of postdocs and uh, research assistants and, you know, <laughs> the poor people have to listen to me talk all the time and, and <laughs> you know, they, they get tired of it. And <laughs> I think that, you know, when I get really excited about something, um, they, they're, they aren't sure whether uh, it's, you know, is, real this, or... is this real yeah. or is he just a big weirdo? Um, and so, you know, maybe maybe uh, bringing in collaborators maybe help validate yeah. me a little bit. But also um, what I see in the lab is, you know, Brett's interacting with all of, all of the people in my lab. Mm. And um, our other visiting scientist, Lisa Petrella, is interacting with our students in the lab and and our postdocs. And and boy, uh, that that is really fun to just observe um, because you see that um, it, it it's adding to the perspective of our trainees and it's giving them um, some more insight. Um, it's it's helping them to look for other you know for um, uh, opportunities that might um uh that we might not 
um, be spe uh, that we might not have a specialty to address, mm -hmm. but they they are not locked into just thinking that there's one person yeah. with all the answers. Um, yeah. It's a uh, it's a good system. That's great. And they and they find out you know, the trainees I've been thinking of my graduate student too. They find out pretty quickly that you're that you <laughs> perhaps don't know everything <laughs> that uh, that you need to know. And uh, my PhD student is is involved in this project with the Dustin's lab as well, and she's. Uh, you know, very anxious to, to bounce questions off me, but then take them also to Dustin or to Joel, who's mm -hmm. in Joel Traber, who's involved in this project. And, and uh, it's part of, of developing your, I'll say, boldness as a, as a trainee, as a student, to say, I, uh, I can learn from more than just this one person mm -hmm. who is my mentor. Mm -hmm. um, challenges me as well, because I, you know, if I'm wrong and Dustin corrects it, I have to. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and you know, and this is something I think that the, the possibility too of of these trainees and students also um, trekking and being able to come here and spend a little time. Mm -hmm. I know, um, you know, Herman's lab is, is is very involved in that. That these trainees too can benefit from being uh, from visiting and working for some time in the laboratory. Yeah. Um, they they get that sense that. Science is done in lots of different places by lots of different people, mm. um, done slightly differently, but but always with you know a, a, the ability to, to interact with you know with other experts, and that's the good. Mm. That's great. So I want to just check in with our online folks. Any questions or any questions from our audience here? I don't want to monopolize these guys. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. With collaboration, to me, there's always an issue of intellectual property. Who discovers it? Who gets credit for it? Who owns it? So when you have a collaboration like this, or is this just such basic science that it doesn't apply? And then my question for Dr. Tepper is, you are visiting one of the beautiful, most beautiful places on Earth. I hope you get out and do other things. <laughs> I'll answer the second question first. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, I was thinking, uh, and, and, and the art almost be found the whole thing I go. Um, I I spend um, a lot of hours in the in the laboratory, and then I decide I don't have anything to do right now. <laughs> and I go back and get my my mountain bike and put it on the back of the truck, and I just sleep in there. And then I it's a wonderful. I mean, it, you can't imagine how how fulfilling it is to me to know I can do that even with just a few hours in the afternoon, as opposed to having to trek. On vacation somewhere. This is the opportunities that are so close at hand here um, to, to sort of um, diffuse from the, the, from the research work to, to kind of um, put your mind at, at ease and, and be elsewhere. It's, it's really, I think it helps the science, to be honest, because you, you get a chance to be away from it and, and thinking about something completely different. So I didn't interrupt you. Oh, yeah, I'll see. Um, so uh, intellectual property, you know, I, I don't know. I have a perspective that um, uh, two minds are better than one. And really, there's no competition um, between Brett and I um, because it, it's, you know, we're, we're for these projects, we're, we're both authors on it. There's no demerits for having extra authors um, mm -hmm. and the fact it just looks better you know it looks better for grant applications and and other things um and so I, I, it's not a, it's not a factor for me at all <laughs> i think um the you know it, it's almost the, the, the opposite issue that, that um, many of the scientists that we interact with and collaborate with are so gracious that that they're they're willing to to participate and collaborate, and they don't they don't really want a lot lot back from it because being part of that collaboration and then having it published is is the the track record you need when it goes when it comes to coming up for more funding. Uh, you you can point back and say, well, you know, I've I've in, in my last publication, I I was collaborating with someone in Australia and I was collaborating with someone in. in East Carolina, and, and that only looks better uh, from the perspective of doing the research science. Mm -hmm. um, you know, developing things that might lead toward patents, and uh, this is a big thing at, at ECU and the School of Medicine, 
um, there needs to be, you know, a, an honest meeting of the minds. Usually it's pretty obvious who has brought the major portion of the work and who has done the, the lesser portion. I don't think we, I mean, I, Dustin Dust and I certainly don't have those disputes. And I think most of our colleagues um, that we collaborate with otherwise are also pretty upfront about it. Um, so it works, it's worked so so far very well in, in this end and in other collaborations that I've had. That's great. Any other questions? Any questions online? Anything like that? All right, good. Well, listen, as we kind of wrap up, um, Brett, are there other opportunities, I mean, that you're aware of to go and, you know, have a visiting visiting experience like the one um, that you've had here, or have you had other experiences with other institutions? So um, there, yeah, I mean, the, the, there are there are opportunities you have often short term, really very short term. As um, I before I worked with Cielian, I used to work with a frog called called Venibus, and uh, and there were some expert labs uh, in 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 that area, uh, particularly at the National Institutes of Health in, in Bethesda, and I was running into some you know a, a, a log jam with the types of experiments I was doing. I spoke to one of my colleagues, this is while I was still at LSU uh, at the Health Sciences Center there. And he said, oh, my old boss used to do this work and, uh, and you should give him a call. And I called this gentleman's name was Ugo Davi, and he's really well known in, in, in that area of, of Zenfos germ cell regulation. And uh, Igor said, yeah, you should come uh, spend time, bring your reagents, we'll do the experiments here. And I worked out to go there for a week, week and a half. And, um, we got experiments done that I probably would have spent months and months on back at, in Louisiana uh, and that we got them done in a week there. So um, I think that happens more frequently than, than mm -hmm. you, know, like you might guess. Um, I think what's unique here at NBI is that, is that um, there is such a breadth of, of expertise and understanding in a very, very small concentrated group of people. And, uh, and that's that is a bit unique. Um, I think of other institutes. There's a uh, an institute I visited uh, in Massachusetts, Whittle um, uh, Marine Biology Labs, and uh, and there too there are a lot of scientists working and collaborating and things. You have the opportunity uh, sometimes to be invited there to as a uh, a researcher, but they really are focused around more concentrated areas uh, and. Uh, uh, the same at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories, which is in New York. They, they're, um, they're places that you might get an opportunity to be involved uh, with and go to, but it requires having that, you know, established collaboration or that established friendship with another scientist who might be able to, to bring you and really being in kind of a, 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 a smaller cadre of, of research areas. Mm -hmm. um, here, I think, I mean, from from kidney function to axolotl to to germ cells, to, there's so many areas represented that that it's uh, it's pretty remarkable that it's all done here. That's great. Any other questions before we say thanks to these guys for a great conversation? Thank you both so much for sharing and and for, for uh, giving us an insight into into what these collaborations look like. It's really terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.